Uh, Mr. Speaker, sir, at the very outset, I'd like to thank you for enabling us to table this very important resolution and for having allotted this specific time. Mr. Speaker, sir, I beg to move that where is the Meghalaya Residents Safety and Security Act 2016 has been enacted and notified for ensuring safety and security of the residents of the state? And where is the Meghalaya Residents Safety and Security Amendment Bill 2020 passed by this August House is yet to be assented to by the governor, thereby resulting in delay in implementation of a crucial legislation of this August House? Therefore, this House now resolved to urge the government for a personalization of the Meghalaya Residents Safety and Security Act 2016 as per the mandate of the Principal Act in the best interest of the state. I would like to be very brief, uh, Mr. Speaker, sir, keeping in mind the constraint of time uh, and the limited time that is available for the private member's business. Uh, while trying to be brief, Mr. Speaker, sir, I would like to refresh our memories about the background which led to the enactment of this crucial piece of legislation by this August House. And this piece of legislation, as it has been conceptualized and designed and formatted, is based on the collective voice that echoed from across the state, based on the kind of challenges that confront the state and the people as a whole. The issue, issue of safety and security of the residents is a very complex issue. And the sense of security that we need to instill in the minds of the citizens at large is also a very complex issue. It requires continuous effort to achieve that objective. Despite many legislations that exist, we still will have to grapple and we continue to grapple to find answers. And that answers also revolves around mandating through decisions which ultimately culminate into lawmaking as lawmakers by all of us. Now, if we look at the different entries, both in the union list, state list, and the concurrent list, we are quite clear in our own responsibilities vis-a-vis -vis the empowerment of this August House to legislate pertaining to the subjects which are entered in the respective entries under the seventh schedule of the list two. Now, entry one of the list two is specific to law and order which is in the list two of the seventh schedule. Therefore, legislative responsibility as well as the legislative jurisdiction is within the state legislature. It is both the responsibility and also the legislative jurisdiction. Have we gone beyond? Have we crossed the Luxman Rekha of this mandate of the list in respect of that specific entry? No, in as far as the principal act is concerned. Similarly, the offshoot of this principal act is based on the responsibility of the state and the legislative responsibility of this August House, pertaining to our need to fulfill the various responsibilities as entered in entry 5, entry 18, and entry 64 of the list 2 of the 7th seal of the Constitution of India. Therefore, there has been enough exhaustive deliberation engagement with all the stakeholders who were, who were committed in engaging with the government to find this legislative mandate and thereby 
equip the state with the wherewithal to deal with these mandate of the law. Now, unfortunately, without any intent to blame, I think uh, post-2018, the then government, the MD1, wanted to further amend it. I did take uh, at least a sincere effort to caution the government that it may not be within the legislative mandate, legislative jurisdiction of the state legislature. If we further go beyond this, whatever has been accommodated and appropriately formatted and mandated in the principal act. Because there were certain, certain clauses which were proposed to be included in that proposed amendment, which was eventually passed by this August House. And we knew. And for that reason only, we cautioned again and again at the time then, uh, that <clears throat> let the mandate of the principal act be first implemented in letter and spirit. And as we proceed further, let us learn from this experience and look at if there is any space for further amendment and further improvement. Keeping in mind the sole intent and objective of the act itself, the, if we go by the preamble of this principal act, uh, I would like to just read out this intent, the preamble. The Meghalaya Resident Safety and Security Act 2016, an act to ensure enhanced security, vetting of the tenants, and to ensure the safety and security of the citizens of the state by preventing anti-social elements from gaining shelter in the state, which might be detrimental to peace and tranquility, to maintain public order and peace, to verify and regulate the tenants residing in rented houses in the state, to establish district task force and facilitation centers, to facilitate effective enforcement of various laws for safety and security, of citizens and for matters connected therewith or incidental thereto. So the whole intent is within the domain of the mandate in as far as the relevant entries for the state list is concerned. Now if we, again, this principal act also was urgently needed at that point of time not just because we needed to address the concern of safety and security and also the other associated challenges which unfold in the event of state authorities not being able to uh, deal with them effectively, but also because there was a necessity to further, further strengthen our existing traditional system of administration through the mandate of law, which was questioned by the judiciary at that point of time creating confusion and also derailment of the whole process of the whole administration which withstood the test of time in as far as the administration of the local traditional bodies are concerned. We remember the judgment of one of the honorable judges of the Shillong High Court questioning the authority and legal mandate through an enactment of law pertaining to the authorities of the local bodies, the headmen, it became a very sensitive issue. We were confronted by this extraordinary challenge and circumstance thereof. Therefore, uh, look at the mandate of this law, how we could overcome this judicial intervention by the mandate of this very law, which the August House was so pleased to pass and subsequently assented. We didn't have any problem to get assented to this principal act because it was well within the legislative jurisdiction of this state legislature read to the relevant entries of the list two of the seventh schedule of the Constitution of India. Now here, if <coughs> I would like to therefore refer to this list, entry five, 
which refers to local government, that is to say, the constitution of powers of municipal corporation, improvement trust, district boards, mining settlement authorities, and other local authorities for the purpose of local self-government and village administration. This is well within the entry entered in the list two of the Constitution of India, of the seventh seal of the Constitution of India. And this was needed. In absence of that, we had so much of chaotic situation, questioning the real intent of the government as to whether it was the government who tried to dilute the power of the local bodies, the headmen. I remember that there was a misinformation campaign to create a doubt that it was the government of that time who tried to really trample upon the powers of the local authorities. But it was not so. But there was a judicial intervention. And when we looked at the whole judgment of the honorable judge of that high court, we could see that, OK, there was a lacuna which was really taken advantage of. Therefore, it was our failure not to really cover it with the legislation. We did it. It is the true empowerment of our local traditional bodies, the hetman. Therefore, this importance of this law and allowing this law to be remain ineffective or in other words, to keep it in abeyance from its implementation because of the proposed amendment resulting in this debt law defeats the intent of the principal act, which was an offshoot of a collective endeavor of all concern, of all the stakeholders of this state, realizing our sacred responsibility towards protecting the interests of our local bodies, traditional institutions, the headman's powers and responsibilities. We revived it, we restored it through the mandate of this law. Therefore, Mr. Speaker, sir, I have always maintained that let us not do anything which can jeopardize the real mandate of this law. And this law ultimately became a subject to scrutiny. It was subjected to scrutiny, judicial scrutiny rather, and, but it had withstood the scrutiny itself. The act in its principal form, the principal act. But the amended bill which was passed by this August House is still lingering because of the relevant provision of the Constitution of India which refers to Article 220, 201. The Article 200 was applied by the Honorable Governor before giving assent to the amended act. Then the relevant provision of Article 201 should apply, should apply. But we don't find this happening. Therefore, Mr. Speaker, sir, it has become necessary for us to see that we allow the implementation of the mandate of this very important and crucial piece of legislation in its original form. Let the principal act of Meghalaya Resident Safety and Security Act 2016 be operationalized in letter and spirit to really take care of the sacred responsibility of the state government. We all are aware of the kind of peculiar situation which is extraordinary to the state of Meghalaya and the rest of the states in the Northeast. We are all aware. This particular challenge that we face as one of the states of the Northeast may not be well understood by people from other states or other parts of the country. We, the people of Northeast, have been bearing the brunt of the whole problem that was an offshoot of the partition of this great nation post-independence. And subsequently, the other challenges associated with this long porous border with the neighboring countries, particularly Bangladesh. We know why there are concerns. We know why our young men sometimes take recourse to intervening by even confronting the mandate of law, taking law into their hands. Because 
we, in spite of having this mandate of law, we do not understand the magnitude of the value of this piece of legislation, which is an offshoot of the collective resolve of the people of this August House at that point of time. With a complete exhaustive contribution of those who were part and parcel of the ex exhaustive due deliberation while we were formatting this piece of legislation. Mr. Deputy Speaker, sir, we understand that there was at that point of time in 2013 a movement asking the authorities to implement the provision of the Bengal Eastern Frontier Regulation in 1873, the inner line permit. And while we were in the helm of affairs of governance, it was our sacred responsibility to really understand before we, commitment, we give commitment to our people who wanted the implementation of the provision of this regulation 1873. In short, ILP. I made sincere efforts to really understand the mind of the government of India, the whole system, as to whether if we want to implement this ILP, we will be able to really overcome the challenges of the hurdles which might be posed by the government of India. And I knew, I doubted the commitment of the government of India to allow us to really take advantage of this <coughs> provision. <coughs> and to implement the provision of ILP in Meghalaya. Therefore, rather than giving a false promise to the people, we looked at the available spaces <coughs> in, within the Constitution, within the mandate of the Constitution, vis-a-vis -vis the legislative power and legislative jurisdiction that our, this August House has this mandate of the Constitution of India. I have referred to the various entries. Therefore, I knew for certainty that even if we try and try and try, it will take a long time. Maybe we will prevail, but we were not looking that the end of the tunnel was short. The tunnel looked too long and circuitous in as far as uh, the capacity of the state government to be able to convince the government of India is concerned for implementation of ILP. So we had to be practical that let there be some legislation which at least take cognizance of the reality in the ground zero, vis a -vis the challenges which we are confronted with in respect of illegal immigration, the influx, and the threat to our demography, which is a concern of all of us, keeping in mind the ramification that can have over the decades after us. Therefore, in absence of the ILP, we thought let there be, an, there be an exhaustive law which besides empowering the people, particularly our traditional institutions, the local authorities, inconsistent with our customary laws and practices, be empowered and mandated through the law. We did it. Now, if we look at the implementation also, how these local authorities become integral part of the whole implementation of this program, leaving no space for any of the government authorities to be really vulnerable to any manipulation. It has been so designed. That means it is a collective resolve where people of the state have agreed to come together. But we need to further see the scope of how we will really truly empower them. Maybe certain other amendments are required where the fund have to be provided to the local authorities, to the Rangbash norms, so that while they remain committed to implement the mandate of this very principal act, they also are given all the necessary support, all the wherewithals from the government to effectively implement the mandate of the law in letter and spirit. Now, this <coughs> law as it was put to a judicial scrutiny as well. The section 17 of the principal act was challenged. Rather, the whole act was challenged, but then there was an observation by the, at the time of the judicial scrutiny. But 
I would like to reaffirm with complete clarity that this does not infringe upon any of the fundamental rights of the citizens as enshrined and mandated in the Constitution of India. It was necessary, therefore, for the government and the whoever was representing the government in the court to effectively defend it. How it could not be defended, I don't know, because there is no such provision in the section 17 or 18 which should be considered as infringement upon any of the fundamental rights of any of the citizens. It is the sacred responsibility of the state to ensure that they, we embark upon all possible ways and means to provide the safety and security and to instill that sense of safety and security, not for the day, but for the years and generations to come. Therefore, though the government did not effectively defend it in the court of law, I will urge upon the government that it should be defended effectively, successfully, because this is a misgiving. I have reasons to doubt the manner in which this very section, the mandate of this section was implemented at the time of implementation as it started implementing in peacemeal. Mr. Speaker, sir, because if we go by the section 17 and the subsequent section 18, it is very clear that we identified Department of Tourism to be the nodal department to facilitate this so-called facilitation center. Look at the nomenclature that we use. It's not to subject any citizen who are entering the state to all kinds of verification to restrict their interstate movement. No, it was to facilitate. It was to ensure that the law that has been enacted can be actually implemented in letter and spirit. Otherwise, it will remain as a, just a, a you know, intended law. How do we implement? Keeping in mind the long interstate border and long international so-called referred to as porous international border with Bangladesh. Therefore, this facilitation center, under no circumstances, is there any mandate in as far as the principal act is concerned which can be construed as something which goes beyond the relevant entries under the seventh schedule of the least two. Therefore, if need be, let there be further amendment subsequently. But at the same time, I have failed to understand why the relevant provision of the Article 200 and 201 was not invoked if there was delay or there was reason for the Honorable Governor not to assent. Because the Article 200 of the Constitution of India is very clear. The Article 200 and the first proviso, and also the Article 201 and the proviso, it's very clear that in the event of, let me read it, when a bill, Article 200 of the Constitution of India, when a bill has been passed by the legislature, assembly of a state, or in the case of a state having a legislative council, has been passed by both houses of the legislature of the state, it shall be presented to the governor, and the governor shall declare either that he assents to the bill or that he withholds assent therefore, or that he reserves the bill for the consideration of the president. Provided, the first proviso I'm reading, provided that the governor may, as soon as possible, after the presentation to him of the bill for assent, return the bill if it is not a money bill together with a message, with a message requesting that the house or the houses will reconsider the bill or any specified provision thereof, and in particular, will consider the desirability of introducing any such amendment as he may recommend in his message. And when a bill is so returned, the House or Houses shall reconsider the bill accordingly, and if the bill is passed again by the House or Houses with or without amendment and presented to the Governor for assent, the governor shall not withhold assent. Therefore, 
provided, second proviso, provided further that the governor shall not assent to, but shall reserve for the consideration of the president any bill which, in the opinion of the governor, would, if it becomes law, so derogate from the power of the High Court as to endanger the provision which that court, as by this constitution, designed to fill. Article 201. When a bill is reserved by a governor for the consideration of the president, the president shall declare either that he assents to the bill or that he withholds assent therefore, provided that where the bill is not a money bill, the president may direct the governor to return the bill to the House or, as the case may be, the houses of the legislature of the state together with such a message as is mentioned in the first proviso to the Article 200. It's very clear. So why is there delay? We must take it up. But the problem is that while the principal act was being drafted, we all as collective authors knew that we were doing a tight rope walking. Within the relevant entries of the least two in the seventh siddle of the Constitution of India. It was a very difficult job. I would not further elaborate, but it was a difficult job. It was a tight rope walking. The moment we wanted to add something else, it went beyond the mandate of the relevant entries of the least two of the seven schedule. That's why we have a mess. Therefore, sometimes people question whether the intention of the government was to delay the implementation of this mandate of this principal act for whatever reasons best known to them. This is a question coming. At that point of time, people are saying, well, we see, we can see, because the power of anticipation is very crucial for all of us when we embark upon any new thing. What will be the outcome? Here it was very clear. We have the entries in both the least one and least two of the seven serial of the Constitution of India, and of course on the least three. Therefore, people are starting questioning us. Is there really an uh, honest intent to implement such laws or come up with such laws, if need be, to really be able to fulfill our sacred responsibilities towards dealing with the contentious issues which are not required to be elaborately stated here? Because there are some things which can be discussed within the four walls in the discussion room, but then sometimes not possible in the August House. We have made it abundantly clear at that time when we were engaging with the stakeholders. Because certain things which we share may not be sometimes palatable for many, and it might also create a situation where people can put hurdles in advance because in politics everything is possible. Therefore, Mr. Speaker, sir, I fervently appeal to the government of the day. Let us really do justice to our responsibilities. The challenges that is facing our state is really a reality. We cannot shy away from it. That was the reason why we enacted this law. And that is the reason why you have all those violent response by the frustrated young men who ultimately, from frustration, become a victim of their anger and become rebellious. Let us not see frustration of our people becoming anger and subsequently they become rebellious, thereby, thereby threatening our very system. I think there is a need for all of us to really uh, be honest, let our intent be not influenced by our surroundings, but let it come out from our inside out of the true intent to fulfill our sacred responsibilities that is vested upon us as lawmakers. We must remember that we are lawmakers, we are not lawyers. The law that we enact here and the law that is enacted in the parliament are the pieces of law which are debated and based on which judicial interventions take place. So we are lawmakers. We cannot be misled by somebody who may be acting as our AG or whatever we call them. How is it that the legal, the law department and all the wherewithal which supports the law department could not advise the government that you are 
going outside the limit of the relevant entries of the least two of the seventh title of the Constitution of India. There must have been malapied intention by the people who were supporting the government system. Sometimes you don't know, even the bureaucracy must have been instrumental <coughs> in creating that derailment of the mandate of the act. I have reasons to doubt. <coughs> Therefore, Mr. Speaker, sir, <coughs> let us be honest to our people and the relevant responsibility that we have towards our people. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, sir. Therefore, may I ask the government to really agree to adopt this resolution and say that, yes, let us not play politics. Just say that, okay, the submissions are well taken. I think there is a necessity. There is a necessity. We take cognizance of the necessity, and therefore, we will take measures. That's all. So with these few words, Mr. Speaker, sir, I urge the government, let us do justice. Let us do justice. And with these few words, I am sure I have complete, I have reason to believe that the government, all of us, understand the magnitude of the importance of such legislation. We can always look forward for further amendment, further improvement, but let it happen subsequently as we proceed first. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, sir, Thank with you. these few words.